volume two chapter one of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by celine major chapter one difficulties attending a young lady's appearance at a ball a wet sunday difference of taste though it was two minutes and a half past the time named for dinner when agnes made her appearance she found her aunt's temper very slightly acerbated by the delay for the delightful recollections of her morning expedition still endured and she was more inclined to boast than to scold well agnes i hope at last i have some news that will please you she said what think you of my having subscribed for us both for six weeks subscribed for what aunt to the library yes i have subscribed there too for a month and we must go every day rain or shine to make it answer but i have done a good deal more than that for you my dear i have subscribed to the balls entirely for your sake agnes and whatever becomes of you in future life i trust you will never forget all i have done for you now but i am afraid aunt it will cost you a great deal of money to take me with you to the balls and as i have never been yet i cannot know anything about it you know and i do assure you that i shall not at all mind being left at home and a pretty story that would make wouldn't it i tell you child i have paid the money already and here are the cutlets so sit down and be thankful for all my kindness to you is my beer come jerningham agnes sat down and began eating her cutlet but it was thoughtfully for there were cares that rested heavily upon her heart and though they were certainly of a minor species she must be forgiven if at sixteen and a half they were sufficient to perplex her sorely she had neither shoes nor gloves fit to appear at a ball she dared not ask for them she dared not go without them and she dared not refuse to go at all this certainly is the most beautiful place i ever saw in my life said the widow while renewing her attack upon a dish of cutlets such shops such a milliner and as for the library it's perfectly like going into public what an advantage it is every morning of one's life to be able to go to such a place as that elizabeth peters seemed to know everybody and i heard them talking of people of the highest fashion as some of those we are sure to meet at the ball what an immense advantage it is for you agnes to be introduced in such a manner at such a place as this it is indeed a most beautiful place aunt and the peterses are most kind and charming people then for once in your life child you are pleased that's a comfort and i have got something to show you agnes such a scarf real french blonde it's monstrous expensive i'm afraid but everybody says that the respectability of a girl depends entirely upon the style of her chaperone i'm sure i would no more let my poor dear sister's child go out without me if i was shabbily dressed than i would fly i wonder mrs duval does not send home my things but perhaps she waits for me to send my turban she's going to put my feathers in for me agnes quite a favour i assure you but she was so respectful in her manner to elizabeth peters i am sure if i had any notion what sort of people they were i should have made barnaby leave his business to mr dobbs for a little while that he might have brought me to see them long ago it is indeed a pleasure to meet with such friends said agnes and perhaps perhaps what child if either of the three girls stay away from the ball perhaps aunt you would be so kind as to let me stay away too and we should pass the evening so delightfully together god give me patience agnes for i'm sure you are enough to drive one wild here have i been subscribing to the balls and actually paying down ready money beforehand for your tickets and now ungrateful creature that you are you tell me you won't go i only wish the peterses could hear you and then they'd know what you are my only objection to going to the ball aunt said agnes with desperate courage is the fear that you should be obliged to get gloves and shoes for me gloves and shoes why that's just the advantage of mourning you'll have my black silk stockings you know all except a pair or two of the best and with black stockings i don't suppose you would choose to put on white shoes that would be rather too much in the magpie style i suppose wouldn't it and for gloves i don't see how in such very deep mourning you would wear anything but black gloves too and there are two pair of mine that you may have i could lend you an old pair of my black satin shoes too only your feet and your hands are so frightfully out of proportion to your height i was always reckoned to be most perfectly in proportion every part of my figure 
but your hands and feet are absolutely ridiculous from their smallness you take after your father in that and a great misfortune it is for it will prevent you ever profiting by my shoes or my gloves either unless you are clever enough to take them in and i don't believe you are not fingers and all may i wear long sleeves then aunt said agnes with considerable animation from having suddenly conceived a project by means of which she thought she might render herself and her sables presentable because you have got no long gloves i suppose why yes child i see no objection in such very deep mourning as yours it is a strange whim you have taken agnes but it is certainly very convenient and will you give me leave aunt to use all the black you have been so kind as to give me use it use all of it yes i don't want to have any of it again the great desire of my life is to be liberal and generous to you in all ways agnes but i don't know what you mean about using it all you can't mean all the things at once no aunt replied agnes laughing i don't mean that but if i may use the crape that covers nearly the whole of your best gown i think i could make my own frock look very well for i would make it the same as one i saw last year at empton may i yes if you will child but to say the truth i have no great faith in your mantua-making talents however i am glad to see that you've got such a notion in your head and if it turns out well i may set you to work for me perhaps one of these days i have a great deal of taste in that way but with my fortune it would be ridiculous if i did much beside ornamental work there take away jerningham and bring the two cheesecakes agnes do you wish for one no thank you aunt what a odd girl you are you never seem to care about what you eat i must say that i am a little more dainty and know what is nice and like it too but poor dear barnaby spoilt me in that way and if ever you should be lucky enough to be the idol of a husband as i was you will learn to like nice eating too agnes for it is a thing that grows upon one i believe but i dare say at the out-of-the-way place your aunt betsy put you to there was no great chance of your being overindulged that way that will do jerningham give me that drop of beer and now eat up your own dinner as fast as you can and ask little kitty to show you the way to mrs duval's the milliner and take with you very carefully mind the hat-box that you will find ready tied up on my bed and bring back with you my new scarf and gloves i long to show you my scarf agnes you shall not be ashamed of your chaperon that's a point i'm resolved upon it was saturday night and the important ball was to be on the following tuesday so agnes as soon as the dinner was ended hastened to set about her work a general idea of which she had very clearly in her little head but felt some misgivings about her skill in the detail hardly however had she brought forth her needle and her shears when her aunt exclaimed good gracious child you are not going to set to work now why it is the pleasantest part of the day and i mean to take you out to walk with me under the windows where we saw all the smart people last night just look out and you will see they are beginning to come already put on your things my dear and put your bonnet a little back and try to look as smart as you can you are certainly very pretty but you are a terrible dowdy in your way of putting on your things you have nothing jaunty and taking about you as i used to have at your age agnes and i'm sure i don't know what to do to improve you i suspect that your aunt will get more eyes upon her now than you will with all your youth and that's a shame but i always was famous for putting on my things well agnes retired to her little room but her quiet bonnet was put on much as usual when she came out from it and mrs barnaby might have been discouraged at seeing the very undashing appearance of her companion had she not been conscious that the manner in which she had repaired her own charms and the general style of her dress and person were such as might well atone for it nor was she disappointed as to the degree of attention she expected to draw not a party passed them without giving her a decided stare and many indulged their curiosity by a very pertinacious look over the shoulder after them this was very delightful but it was not all ere they had taken half a dozen turns the widely roaming eyes of mrs barnaby descried two additional gentlemen decidedly the most distinguished-looking personages she had seen approaching from the further end of the walk that tall one is the man we watched last night agnes i should know him amongst a thousand agnes looked up and felt equally convinced of the fact the two gentlemen approached 
and mrs barnaby herself could not have wished for a look of more marked examination than the tall individual bestowed upon her as he went by but satisfactory as this was and greatly as it occupied her attention she was aware also that his companion looked with equal attention at agnes for goodness sake agnes throw back that abominable veil it is getting quite dark already and i am sure you cannot see i can see very well thank you aunt replied agnes fool muttered mrs barnaby but she would not spoil her features by a frown and continued to enjoy for three turns more the repeated gaze of the tall gentleman the following day being sunday was one of great importance to strangers about to be initiated into the society of the place and mrs barnaby had fondly flattered herself that mrs peters or at least the young ladies would upon such an occasion have extended their patronage both to help them to a seat and to tell them who was who but in this she was disappointed in fact a compact had been entered into between mrs peters and her son and daughters by which it was agreed that on condition of her permitting them to join her party at the balls she was always to be allowed to go to church in peace this was so reasonable that even the petted mary submitted to it without a murmur and the consequence was that mrs barnaby found herself left to her own devices as to the manner in which she should make the most of the sabbath day fortunately for the tranquillity of mrs peters the landlady of the lodgings on being questioned gave it as her opinion that the chapel at the hot wells which was within a very pleasant walk would be more likely to offer accommodation to strangers than the parish church that being always crowded by the resident families so to the chapel at the hot wells mrs barnaby resolved to go and the tea-urn was ordered half an hour earlier than usual that time enough might be allowed to get ready now do make the best of yourself agnes to-day will you i am sure those men are not bristol people so different they looked didn't they from all the rest of course you will put on your best crape bonnet and one of my nicest broad-hemmed white crape collars there is one i have quite clean i have no doubt in the world we shall see them having finished her breakfast and reiterated these orders mrs barnaby turned her attention to her own toilette and a most elaborate one it was taking so long a time as to leave scarcely sufficient for the walk but proving at length so perfectly satisfactory as to make her indifferent to that or almost any other contretemps on this occasion she came forth in a new dress of light grey gros de naples with a gay bonnet of paille de riz decorated with poppy blossoms both within and without a ladylike profusion of her own embroidery on cuffs collar and pocket handkerchief her well-oiled ringlets half hiding her large coarse handsome face her eyes set off by a suffusion of carmine and her whole person redolent of musk this was the figure beside which agnes was doomed to make her first appearance at the crowded chapel of the hot wells had she thought about herself the contrast its expansive splendour offered to her own slight figure her delicate fair face seen but by stealth through her thick veil and the sad decorum of her sable robe might have struck her as being favourable instead of that however it was another contrast that occurred to her for as she looked at mrs barnaby she suddenly recollected the general look and air of her aunt compton just at the moment when the widow attacked her so violently on the meanness of her apparel during their terrible encounter at the village school and she could not quite restrain a sigh as she thought how greatly she should have preferred entering a crowded and fashionable chapel with her but no sighing could effect the change and they set forth together as strangely a matched pair in appearance as can well be imagined they entered the crowded building just as the psalms concluded and were stared at and scrutinized with quite as much attention as was consistent with the solemnity of the place moreover seats were after some time offered to them and there was no reason in the world to believe that they were in any way overlooked nevertheless mrs barnaby was disappointed neither the tall gentleman nor his companion were there nor did major allen or any one like him appear to reward her labour and her skill long and wearisome did the steep uphill walk back to her lodgings appear after this unpropitious act of devotion and sadly passed the remainder of the day for it rained hard no strollers not even an idle endimanche came to awaken the musical echo she loved to listen to from the pavement under the windows in short it was a day of existence lost save that she found out one or two new defects in agnes and ended at last by very nearly convincing herself that it was in some way or other her fault that it rained but happily nothing lasts for ever in this world and agnes found herself quietly in bed at last 
the next morning rose bright in sunshine and the widow rose too and blessed the useful light which she determined should see her exactly at the fashionable hour take her away to the library and the pastry cooks or wherever else she was most likely to be seen but fortunately for the rifacimento upon which agnes desired to employ herself this fashionable hour was not early and her sable draperies had made great progress before her aunt gave notice that she must get ready to go out with her to have a voice upon any question of this kind had fortunately never yet occurred to agnes as a thing possible and once more like a belladonna beside a holy hawk she appeared with all the effect of the strongest contrast in the gayest part of clifton this day seemed sent by fate to make up for the misfortunes of the last on entering the library mrs barnaby immediately placed herself before the autographic volume in which she took such particular interest and hardly had she done so when the tall and the short gentleman entered the shop again it was decidedly evident that the tall one fixed his eyes on the widow and the shorter one on her companion the widow's heart beat never had she forgotten the evident admiration her own face and manner produced on her fellow-traveller from silverton or the chilling effect that followed the display of the calm features of her delicate niece she knew that agnes was younger and perhaps even handsomer than herself but this only tended to confirm her conviction that an animated expression of countenance and great vivacity of manner would do more towards turning a young man's head than all the mere beauty in the world what would she have given at that moment for some one with whom she might have conversed with laughing gaiety to whom she might have displayed her large white teeth and on whom she might have turned the flashings of her lustrous eyes it was in vain to look at agnes at such a moment as this for she well knew that nothing she could utter would elicit any better excuse for laughter than might be found in yes aunt or no aunt so nothing was to be done but to raise a glass recently purchased to her eye in order to recognize the unknown passers-by but in doing this she contrived to make le petit doigt show off her rings and now and then cast such a glance at the strangers as none but a mrs barnaby can give after this dumb show had lasted for some minutes the two gentlemen each threw down the newspaper they had affected to read and departed mrs barnaby's interest in the subscription book departed likewise and after looking at the backs of one or two volumes that lay scattered about the counter she too left the shop and proceeded with a dignified and leisurely step along the pavement the next moment was one of the happiest of her life for on turning her head to reconnoitre a richly trimmed mantilla that had passed her she perceived the same pair of gentlemen at the distance of two paces behind them this indeed was an adventure and to the widow's unspeakable delight it was made more piquant still by what followed near the end of the street was the well-frequented shop of a fashionable pastry-cook an establishment by the way which mrs barnaby had not yet lived long enough to pass with indifference for the twofold reason that it ever recalled the dear rencontre of her youth when the disbursement of one penny was sure to secure a whole half-hour of regimental flirting and also because her genuine love for cakes and tarts was unextinguishable there was now again a double reason for entering this inviting museum for in the first place it would prevent the necessity of turning round as soon as they had walked up the street in order to walk down it again thereby proving that they had no engagements at all and secondly it would give the two uncommonly handsome men an opportunity of following them in if they liked it and it so happened that they did like it happy mrs barnaby no sooner had she seated herself beside the counter with a plate of queen cakes and bath buns beside her than the light from the door ceased to pour its unbroken splendour upon her elegant dress and on looking up her eye again met the gaze first of the one and then of the other stranger as they entered the shop together agnes was standing behind her with her face rather unmeaningly turned towards the counter for when a plate with various specimens of pastry delicacies was offered to her by one of the shopwomen she declined to take anything by a silent bow the two gentlemen passed her and established themselves at a little table just beyond desiring that ices might be brought to them you have ices have you said mrs barnaby delighted at an opportunity of speaking bring me one if you please and then trusting to her niece's well-known discretion she turned her chair so as to front both agnes and the two gentlemen and said with great kindness of accent agnes love will you have an ice no thank you aunt the anticipated reply followed then sit down dearest will you while i take mine the younger of the two gentlemen instantly sprang from his chair and presented it to her 
agnes bowed civilly but passed on to a bench which flanked the narrow shop on the other side but mrs barnaby smiled upon him most graciously and said bowing low as she sat thank you sir very much you are extremely obliging the young man bowed again reseated himself and finished his ice in silence when his companion having done the same each laid a sixpence on the counter and walked off who are those gentlemen pray do you know their names said mrs barnaby eagerly to the shop-girl the tall gentleman is colonel hubert ma'am and the other young mr stephenson stephenson musingly repeated the widow stephenson and hubert i am sure i have heard the names before sir edward stephenson was married on saturday to colonel hubert's sister ma'am said the girl and it is most likely that you heard of it oh to be sure i did i remember now all about it they said he was the handsomest man in the world colonel hubert i mean and so he certainly is handsomer certainly than even major allen don't you think so agnes i don't know major allen aunt not know major allen child oh i remember no more you do my dear come get up i have done the young man agnes she said turning to her niece as they left the shop seemed i thought a good deal struck by you i wish to goodness child you would not always keep that thick veil over your face so it is a very handsome veil i know and certainly makes your mourning look very elegant but it is only in some particular lights that one can see your face under it all i don't think that signifies much aunt and it makes me feel so much more comfortable comfortable very well child poke along and be comfortable your own way but you certainly have a little spice of the mule in you the widow was perhaps rather disappointed at seeing no more of the two strangers they had turned off just beyond the pastry-cook's shop and were no longer visible but while she follows in gentle musings her walk home we will pursue the two gentlemen who had so captivated her attention the only resemblance between them was in the decided air of bon ton that distinguished both in every other respect they were perfectly dissimilar mr stephenson the shorter and younger of the two had by far the more regular set of features and was indeed remarkably handsome colonel hubert his companion appeared to be at least ten years his senior and looked bronzed by the effect of various climates he had perhaps no peculiar beauty of feature except his fine teeth and the noble expression of his forehead from which however the hair had already somewhat retired though it still clustered in close brown curls round his well-turned head but his form and stature were magnificent and his general appearance so completely that of a soldier and a gentleman that it was impossible let him appear where he would that he should pass unnoticed which perhaps to the gentle-minded may be considered as some excuse for mrs barnaby's enthusiastic admiration for heaven's sake hubert said the junior to the senior as they passed onwards do give me leave to know a pretty girl when i see one in my life i never beheld so beautiful a creature her form her feet her movement and what a voice assuredly said colonel hubert in reply to this trade the sweet variety of tone the charming change of her musical cadences must naturally excite your admiration no thank you aunt it was inimitable you are quite right frederick such words could not be listened to with indifference you are an odious carping old fusty musty bachelor and i hate you with all my heart and soul exclaimed the young man upon my honour hubert i shudder to think that some ten or a dozen years hence i may be as hard cold and insensible as you are now tell me honestly can you at all recollect what your feelings were at two-and-twenty on seeing such a being as that sable angel from whom you have just dragged me perhaps not exactly and besides black angels were never the objects of my idolatry but don't stamp your foot at me and i will answer you seriously i do not think that from the blissful time when i was sixteen up to my present solemn five-and-thirty i could ever have been tempted to look a second time at any miss under the chaperonship of such a dame as that feather and fur below lady then why in the name of common sense did you gaze so earnestly at the fur below lady herself to answer that truly frederick would involve the confession of a peculiar family weakness a family weakness pray be confidential i will promise to be discreet and indeed as my brother has just made as the newspapers say a lovely bride of your sister i have some right to a participation in the family secrets come disclose 
what family reason have you for choosing to gaze upon a great vulgar woman verging towards forty and refusing to look at a young creature as beautiful as a houri who happens to be in her company i suspect it is because i am near of kin to my mother's sister did you never hear of the peculiarity that attaches to my respected aunt lady elizabeth norris she scruples not to avow that she prefers the society of people who amuse her by their absurdities to every other oh yes i have heard all that from edward who has i can tell you been occasionally somewhat horrified at what the queer old lady calls her soirée antitestique but you don't mean to tell me hubert that you ever take the fancy of surrounding yourself with all the greatest quizzes you can find in compliment to your old aunt why no i do not go so far as that yet and perhaps i sometimes wish that she did not either for occasionally she carries the whim rather too far yet i believe truly that i am more likely to gaze with attention at a particularly ridiculous-looking woman than at any young nymph under her protection or possessing the awful privilege of calling her aunt a young nymph what a hateful phrase elegant delicate creature i swear to you colonel hubert that you have lowered yourself very materially in my estimation by your want of tact in not immediately perceiving that although an epitine connection unhappily exists between them by marriage probably or by the half-blood there must still be something very peculiar in the circumstances which have brought so incongruous a pair together well frederick you may be right and perhaps my friend my eyes begin to fail me for to tell you the truth your adorable crape veil was too thick for me to see anything through it to be sure it was cried stephenson quite delighted at the amende i thought it was impossible you could underrate such a face as that it is a great blessing to have young eyes rejoined the colonel relapsing into his bantering tone what at it again thou crusty old mars then i leave you au revoir my coridon and so they parted end of chapter one volume two chapter two of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two: The Ball. The evening of the ball, so much dreaded by the niece and so much longed for by the aunt, arrived at last. And by a chance not over common in the affairs of mortals, while the hopes of the one lady were more than realized, the fears of the other were proved to be altogether groundless. Many favorable accidents, indeed, concurred to lessen the difficulties anticipated by Agnes in the first place her almost funeral robes for which of the truth be spoken it must be avowed she had not the slightest partiality assumed an appearance under her tasteful fancy which surprised even herself for though when she set about it she had a sort of beau ideal of a black crape robe floating in her imagination her hopes of giving it form and substance by her own ingenuity were not very sanguine mrs barnaby either from the depth of her sorrow or the height of her elegance had commanded when she ordered her widow's mourning that one dress should touch the heart of every beholder by having a basement of sable crape one yard in breadth around it this doleful dress was costly and had been rarely worn at silverton that it might come forth in great splendour at exeter but at exeter as we have seen the widow's feelings so completely overpowered her that she could not wear it at all and thus it came under the fingers of agnes in very respectable condition of these circumambulatory ells of crape the young artificer contrived to fabricate a dress that was anything but unbecoming the enormous crape gigot for those were the days of gigot which made part of her black treasure hung from her delicate fair arms like transparent clouds upon the silvery brightness of the moon so at least would frederick stephenson have described it while the simple corsage drawn at la vierge rather higher than fashion demanded round her beautiful bust gave a delicate and sober dignity to her appearance that even those who would have deemed it a pity to be so covered up themselves could not but allow was exceedingly becoming as soon as her labour was ended she prudently made an experiment of its effect and then in trembling hope of her aunt's approval made her appearance before her her success here perfectly astonished her mercy on me child what an elegant dress where on earth did you get it from from your gown aunt oh to be sure i understand it is not many people that would give away such a dress as that agnes perfectly new and so extremely elegant i hope it won't turn your brain my dear and that you will never forget who gave it to you certainly i never thought you so handsome before 
and if you will but study my manner a little and smile and show your fine teeth i do really think i may be able to get a husband for you which would certainly be more creditable than going out as a governess so you can work agnes i see and a good thing too considering your poverty it does not look amiss upon the whole i must say though i don't see any reason for your covering yourself up so i am sure your neck is white enough to be seen and it would be odd if it wasn't considering who your mother was for both she and i were noted far and near for that beauty but i can't say i ever hid myself up in that way and what shoes child have you got to wear with it these aunt said agnes putting out her little foot encased in leather with a sole of very respectable thickness well upon my word that's a pity it spoils all and i don't think you could dance in them if you did get a partner what would you say agnes if i bought you a thin pair of prunella pumps on purpose i should be very much obliged to you aunt well then for once i must be extravagant i believe so get on your other gown child as quick as you can and your bonnet and shawl and let us go to the shop round the corner i did not mean to stir out to-day there is wind enough to make one's eyes perfectly bloodshot however the shop's close by only if you do marry well i hope you will never forget what you owe me agnes had been too hard at work to take any long walk though invited to do it but her friend mary called upon her both monday and tuesday and having found her way into the closet seemed to think as she pulled over agnes's books and chatted with her concerning their contents that they might often enjoy themselves tete-a-tete -tete there shall you like it agnes she added after sketching such a scheme to her i think mary you could make me like anything but can i really make you like sitting in this cupboard instead of your own elegant drawing-room if you will sit with me here my new friend answered miss peters with an air of great sincerity then must i not be wicked if i ever think myself unhappy again at least as long as we stay at clifton dear girl you should not be so if i could help it but i must go nine o'clock this evening remember and wait for us in the outer room if you do not find us already there these instructions agnes repeated to her aunt but that lady's ardent temper induced her to order a fly to be at her door at half-past eight precisely and when it arrived she was for at least the fourth time putting the last finishing touch to her blonde and her feathers and her ringlets and her rouge and therefore it took her not more than five minutes for a last general survey before she declared herself ready and jerningham received orders to precede her down the stairs with a candle if the former descriptions of the widow's appearance have not been wholly in vain the reader will easily conceive the increased splendour of her charms when elaborately attired for a ball without my entering into any minutiae concerning them suffice it to say that if the corsage of the delicate agnes might have been deemed by some too high that of mrs barnaby might have been thought by others too low and that taken altogether she looked exceedingly like one of the supplementary dames brought forth to do honour to the banquet scene in macbeth arriving half an hour before the time appointed they of course did not find the peters family nor did this latter party make their appearance before the patience of mrs barnaby had given away and she had insisted much to the vexation of agnes upon going on to the ball-room without them there the atmosphere was already in some degree congenial to her the lustres were blazing the orchestra tuning and a few individuals as impatient as herself walking up and down the room and appearing greatly delighted at having something new to stare at this parade was beginning to realize all the worst fears of agnes for the room was filling fast and mrs barnaby would not hear of sitting down when she descried mrs peters her son her three daughters and two other gentlemen enter the room mrs barnaby saw them too and instantly began to stride towards them but timidity now made agnes bold and she held back still courageously retaining her aunt's arm and exclaiming eagerly oh let them come to us aunt nonsense child don't hold me so agnes it will be exceedingly rude if we do not join them immediately according to our engagement the pain of violently seizing upon miss peters was however spared her by the watchful kindness of mary who caught sight of them immediately and together with elizabeth hastened forward to meet them miss peters gave a glance of approbation and pleasure at the appearance of agnes who did not look the less beautiful perhaps from the deep blush that dyed her cheeks as she marked the expression of mrs peters countenance as she approached with her eyes fixed upon her aunt 
that lady however let her have felt what she might at sight of her remarkable-looking sister-in-law very honourably performed her part of the compact entered into with her daughters smiling very graciously in return for her affectionate relative's raptures at seeing her and showing no symptom of anything she felt on the occasion excepting immediately retiring to the remotest corner of the room where she very nearly hid herself behind a pillar mrs barnaby of course followed her with the young ladies to the seat she had chosen but her active genius was instantly set to work to discover how she might escape from it for the feelings produced by such an eclipse were perfectly intolerable i must pretend that i see some person whom i know thought she and so make one of the girls walk across the room with me but at the instant she was about to put this project into execution james peters came up to the party and very civilly addressed her this was something for the young man was handsome and well dressed but better still was what happened next for she immediately felt at once that she was about to become the heroine of an adventure major allen whose appearance altogether including moustaches favoris collier grec embroidered waistcoat and all was very nearly as remarkable as her own entered the room looked round it fixed his eyes upon her spangled turban and very decisively turned off from the throng in order to pay his compliments to the peters party distinguishing her by a bow that spake the profoundest admiration and respect elizabeth was the last of the row her mother with mrs barnaby next her being at the other end of it and close to elizabeth the dashing major placed himself immediately entering into a whispered conversation with her which obliged her to turn herself round from the rest in such a manner that not even lucy who came next in order could overhear much of what passed nevertheless the widow felt as certain as if she could have followed every word of it that this earnest conversation was about her nor was she mistaken for thus it ran good evening miss elizabeth you are just arrived i presume an excellent ball is it not i told you it would be what an exceedingly fine woman your aunt is miss peters it is your aunt i think yes our aunt certainly the widow of my mother's brother major allen ay i understood she was your aunt she is a woman of large fortune i hear yes very large fortune but she is in lodgings is she not she does not seem to have taken the whole house oh no only quite small lodgings but she does not spend a third of her income nor near it really then i suppose handsome as she is that she is a little in the skinflint line eh and here the major showed his horse-like teeth by a laugh not that at all i assure you replied the young lady amiably anxious to exonerate her aunt from so vile an aspersion indeed i should say quite the contrary for she has very generous and noble ideas about money and the use a widow ought to make of a fortune left by her husband in case she does not happen to marry again i am sure i hope people won't be so ill-natured as to say she is stingy because she does not choose to spend all her income it will be abominable if they do because her motives are so very noble i am sure she has a most charming advocate in you and what then may i ask for what is noble should never be concealed what can be the reason of economy so unnecessary she does not think it unnecessary major allen for she has an orphan niece who is left quite dependent upon her and what she is saving will be for her amiable indeed then her property is only income i presume really that is a pity considering how remarkably well such a disposition would employ the capital oh no that is not so neither my uncle barnaby left everything entirely at her own disposal only she thinks and here the silly and loquacious elizabeth stopped short for the idea suddenly occurred to her that it was not right to talk so much of her aunt's concerns to so slight an acquaintance as major allen and not exactly knowing how to end her sentence she permitted a sudden thought to strike her and exclaimed i wonder when they will begin dancing but the major had heard enough he resumed the conversation however but very discreetly by saying that young lady in mourning is her niece i suppose and a beautiful creature she is but how comes she to be in such deep mourning when that of her aunt is so slight had the simple elizabeth understood the principle of vicarial mourning upon which these abinements had been transferred from the widow to her niece she would doubtless from the talkative frankness of her nature have disclosed it but as her confidential conversation with her new relative had left her ignorant of this she answered with rather a confused recollection of mrs barnaby's explanation i believe it is because she wears it out of romantic sorrow for her own papa though he has been dead for years and years will you ask your brother miss peters to introduce me to mrs barnaby certainly major allen if you wish it james added the young lady 
stretching out her fan to draw his attention from agnes with whom he was talking james step here major allen wishes you to introduce him to mrs barnaby the major rose at the moment and strengthened the request by adding will you do me that honour mr peters the young man bowed slightly and without answering moved to the front of the happy widow followed by the obsequious major and said major allen wishes to be introduced to you mrs barnaby major allen mrs barnaby it was not without an effort that this consummation of her dearest hopes was received with some tolerable appearance of external composure by the lady but she felt that the moment was an important one and called up all her energy to support her under it perhaps she blushed but that for obvious reasons was not perceptible but she cast down her eyes upon her fan and then raised them again to the face of the bending major with a look that really said a great deal the established questions and answers in use on such occasions were going on with great zeal and animation on both sides when a fresh source of gratification presented itself to the widow in the approach of mr frederick stephenson to agnes in a manner as flatteringly decided as that of the major to herself but being quite a stranger to the peters family he was preceded by the master of the ceremonies who whispered his name and family to mrs peters asking her permission to present him to the young lady in mourning who appeared to be of her party this was of course readily accorded when the introduction took place and was followed by a petition from the young man for the honour of dancing with her agnes looked a vast deal more beautiful than he had ever dared to believe possible through her veil as she answered i am engaged then the next asked mr stephenson eagerly agnes bowed her blushing assent and the young man continued to stand before her going through pretty nearly the same process as the major this lasted till the quadrilles began to form when james peters claimed her hand for the dance two of the miss peters soon followed when major allen said as the young ladies are forsaking you madam may you not be induced to make a party at whist i should have no objection whatever major replied mrs barnaby provided there was room at a table where they did not play high of course if i have the honour of making a table for you my dear madam the stakes will be of your own naming will you permit me to go and see what can be done you are excessively kind i shall be greatly obliged the active mars departed instantly with a step if not as light at least as zealous in its speed as that of mercury when bent upon one of his most roguish errands and in wonderfully short space of time he returned with the intelligence that a table was waiting for her he then presented his arm which she took with condescending dignity and led her off ah sure a pair was never seen so justly formed to meet by nature exclaimed mrs peters to lucy as they walked away and greatly relieved she rose and taking her daughter by the arm joined a party of her friends in a more busy part of the room meanwhile the quadrilles proceeded and agnes notwithstanding the heart-beating shyness inevitably attending a first appearance did not lose her look of sweet composure or her graceful ease james peters was an attentive and encouraging partner and she would probably soon have forgotten that this was the first time she had ever danced except at school had she not when the dance was about half over perceived herself to be an object of more attention to one of the standers-by than any girl so very new can be conscious of without embarrassment the eyes which thus annoyed her were those of colonel hubert his remarkable height made him conspicuous among the throng which was rendered more dense than usual by a wish every moment increasing to look at the beautiful girl in deep mourning and perhaps her happening to know who he was made her fancy that it was more embarrassing to be looked at by him than by any one else the annoyance however did not last long for he disappeared colonel hubert left the place where he had stood and in the study in which he had certainly found some interest for the purpose of looking for his friend stephenson he found him in the doorway frederick i want you said the colonel come with me my good fellow and i will prove to you that notwithstanding my age and infirmities i still retain my faculties sufficiently to find out what is truly and really lovely as ably as yourself come on suffer yourself to be led and i will show you what i call a beautiful girl stephenson quietly suffered himself to be led captive and half a dozen paces placed him immediately opposite to agnes willoughby look at that girl said colonel hubert in a whisper and tell me what you think of her the angel in black yes frederick this is glorious by heaven why hubert it is my own black angel you do not mean to tell me that the girl we saw with that horribly vulgar woman and this epitome of all elegance are the same but upon my soul i do sir and now what do you say to the advantage of being able to see through a thick veil 
i cannot believe it stephenson replied colonel hubert again fixing his eyes in an earnest gaze upon agnes then die in your unbelief and much good may it do you why i have been introduced to her man her name is willoughby and i am to dance the next quadrille with her if this be so peccavi said the colonel turning abruptly away i think so replied his friend following and relinquishing even the pleasure of looking at agnes for that of enjoying his triumph over hubert won't this make a good story and don't you think colonel that for a few years longer at least it may be as well to postpone the adoption of your lady aunt's system and when you see two females together look at both to ascertain whether one of them may not be the loveliest creature in the universe before you give up your whole soul to the amiable occupation of quizzing the other you think this is a very good jest frederick but to me i assure you it seems very much the contrary because it is so melancholy for a man of five-and-thirty to lose his eyesight because stephenson it is so melancholy to know that such a being as that fair girl is in the hands of a woman whose appearance speaks her to be so utterly vulgar to say the very least of it take care my venerable philosopher that you do not blunder about the old lady as egregiously as you before did about the young one when i got the master of the ceremonies to perform for me the precious service of an introduction i inquired about the party that she and the furbelow aunt were with and learned that they were among the most respectable resident inhabitants of clifton i am heartily glad of it frederick and yet if their party consisted of the noblest in the land i should still feel this aunt to be a greater spot upon her beauty than any wart or mole that ever disfigured a fair cheek at least it would i think be quite sufficient to keep my heart safe if i thought this uncommon-looking creature still more beautiful than i do which i confess would not be easy i wish your heart joy of its security returned stephenson and now be off and leave me to my happiness for see the set breaks up and i may follow her to her place and again present myself come tell me honestly do you not envy me i never dance you know so much the worse for you mon cher and the gay young man turned off to follow the way that he saw agnes lead this was to the quarter where she had left her aunt and mrs peters but they found neither don't be frightened said her good-natured partner we shall find my mother in a moment and when they did find her she received agnes with a smiling welcome which contrasted pretty strongly with the stately and almost forbidding aspect with which she ever regarded mrs barnaby young stephenson saw this reception and saw also the empressement with which the pretty elegant mary peters seemed to cling to her more than ever persuaded that he was right and his friend wrong he suddenly determined on a measure that he thought might ensure a more permanent acquaintance than merely being a partner of a dance and before presenting himself to claim her hand he again addressed the master of the ceremonies with a request that he would present him to mrs peters that obliging functionary made not the least objection indeed he knew that there was not a lady in the room either young or old who would not thank him for an introduction to sir edward stephenson's handsome brother himself a cornet in the blues and the inheritor of his mother's noble estate in worcester which made him considerably a richer man than his elder brother all this was known to everybody for the beautiful miss hubert and her lover sir edward had been for a week or two the lions of clifton and though they had mixed very little in its society there was nobody who could be considered as anybody who would not have been pleased at making the acquaintance of frederick stephenson the young man too knew well how to make the most of the ten minutes that preceded the second dance and mrs peters smiled to think as she watched him leading agnes to join the set how justly her keeping faith had been rewarded by this introduction of the most desiree partner in the room meanwhile mrs barnaby was led to the card-room by major allen but he led her slowly and more than once found himself obliged to stop for a minute or two that she might not be incommoded by pressing too quickly through the crowd and thus it was they talked as they gently won their way and what may be the stake that mrs barnaby permits herself said the major bending forward to look into the widow's eyes very low i assure you major replied the lady with a wave of the head that sent her plumes to brush the hirsute magnificence of his face shorts and crown points perhaps rejoined the major agreeably refreshed by the delicate fanning he had received oh fie major how can you suspect me of such extravagance no believe me i know too well how to use the blessings of wealth to abuse them by playing so high as that but i believe gentlemen think that nothing why no my dear madam i cannot say that men that is men of certain fashion and fortune think much of crown points 
for my own part i detest gambling though i love whist and never care how low i play though occasionally when i get into a certain set i am obliged to give way a little but i never exceed five pound points and twenty on the rubber and that you know unless the cards run extravagantly high cannot amount to anything very alarming especially as i play tolerably well and in fact never play so high if i can help it but major said the lady stopping short in their progress i really am afraid that i must decline playing at your table the amount of what i could lose might not perhaps be a great object to me any more than to you but it is a matter of principle with me and when that is the case i never swerve so take me back again will you to my sister peters and my party this was said with a sort of clinging helplessness and delicate timidity that was very touching good heavens exclaimed the major with great animation how very little you know me i would take you charming mrs barnaby to the world's end if you would consent to go with me but i think not that i would sit down at one table though i might sweep from its stakes amounting to thousands when i could play with you for straws at another remember reader that she to whom this was said had been miss martha compton of silverton but six short years before and then judge with what feelings she listened to it they were such that for a moment no power of speech was left to her but she abandoned her purpose of retreat and when at length they stood before the table at which two sporting-looking gentlemen were waiting to receive them she gently seated herself murmuring at the same time in the major's ear not higher than half-crowns if you please he pressed her hand as he resigned the arm with which she had favoured him and as he did so replied depend on me before the arrangements for playing were finally settled the friendly major allen took the two gentlemen a pace or two apart and communicated in a few words what brought them back to the table perfectly contented with the half-crown and gallantly anxious to have the honour of cutting highest that they might have the happiness of winning the lady as a partner if they won nothing else but this happiness fell to the major as well as most others during the three or four rubbers that followed for he and his fair partner played with great luck which helped produce between them that amicable state of spirits which tends to make every word appear a pleasantry and every look a charm in the midst of this very agreeable game in the course of which both the eyes and the voice of the widow proclaimed how very greatly she enjoyed it colonel hubert wandered into the room and having given a glance at one or two other tables as he passed them stationed himself on a sofa from whence he commanded a full view of that at which mrs barnaby was engaged his recent examination of her niece gave him a feeling of interest in this aunt that nearly superseded the amusement he might otherwise have derived from her appearance and manner that both were likely to be affected by the intense interest and pleasure she took in her occupation as well as in the partner who shared it with her may be easily conceived when it is stated that not even the entrance of the magnificent colonel was perceived by her her vivacity her enjouement became more striking every moment her words were full of piquant and agreeable meaning which her eyes scrupled not to second while the major assumed more and more the air and manner of a man enchanted and enamoured beyond the power of concealment but it was not the spirit of quizzing that sat upon colonel hubert's brow as he contemplated this scene on the contrary his fine countenance spoke first disgust and then a degree of melancholy that might have seemed ill befitting the occasion and in a few minutes he walked away and re-entered the ballroom whether intentionally or not may be doubted but he soon again found himself opposite to the place which agnes occupied in the quadrille and being there watched her with a degree of attention that seemed equally made up of curiosity and admiration it is strange thought he that the most repulsive and the most attractive women i ever remember to have seen should be so closely linked together in a few minutes the quadrille ended when mr stephenson who had danced it with the eldest miss peters said to his friend as he passed him we are now going to tea and if you will come with us i will introduce you colonel hubert followed almost mechanically yet not without a feeling somewhat allied to self-reproach at permitting himself to join the party of a mrs barnaby this obnoxious individual was however nearly or rather wholly forgotten within a very few minutes after the introduction took place mrs peters manners were as we know particularly ladylike and pleasing her daughters all pretty-looking and one of them at least singularly animated and agreeable her son and the other gentlemen of her party perfectly comme il faut and agnes what was agnes in the estimation of the fastidious high-minded and high-born colonel hubert he would have been totally unable to answer this question satisfactorily himself 
nor would it be just that a precise answer to it should be expected from the historian this interval of conversation and repose lasted rather longer than usual for the whole party each for some reason or other of their own enjoyed it or at any rate betrayed no wish to bring it to a conclusion had colonel hubert indeed been told that he enjoyed it he would strenuously and sincerely have denied the statement he looked at agnes with wonder and compassion strongly blended he listened to the gay and artless tone of her conversation with mary peters and young stephenson without being able to deny that whether she had fallen from the stars or been raised and wholly educated by that terrible incarnation of all he most detested her vulgar aunt every word she uttered bore the stamp of well-bred association right feeling and bright intelligence he allowed all this and he allowed too that never through all the varieties of his campaigning life had he seen in any rank or in any clime a loveliness so perfect yet he almost trembled as he watched the passionate devotion with which his friend gazed at and listened to her colonel hubert knew the character of stephenson well it was generous ardent and affectionate in the highest degree but passionate withal self-willed and only amenable to control when it came in the shape of influence exercised by friendship unmixed with authority of any kind he was just three-and-twenty and had been in possession of a noble property from the day he attained the age of twenty-one singularly free from vice of any kind his friends in seeing him take the management of his estates into his own hands had but one fear for him it was not racing gambling debauchery or extravagance they dreaded had he already passed fifty years of sober life exempt from all these they would scarcely have felt more secure of his being safe from them but it was in the important affair of marriage that they dreaded his precipitancy more than once already his distinguished and highly connected family had been terrified by the idea that some irremediable misfortune in this respect was about to fall upon them and earnestly did they wish that he should speedily form such a connection as they could approve and had a right to expect unfortunately this wish had been too evident and the idea of being disposed of in marriage by his brother and sisters had become a bugbear from which the young man shrank with equal indignation and contempt the marriage of his elder brother with miss hubert had naturally led to great intimacy between the families and of all the acquaintance he had ever made colonel hubert was the one for whom frederick stephenson felt the warmest admiration and esteem and certainly he was more proud of the affectionate partiality that distinguished individual had shown him than of any other advantage he possessed sir edward stephenson observed this and he had told his betrothed emma that he drew the best possible augury from it for his brother's safety he is so proud of montague's friendship said he that it must be a most outrageous love fit which would make him hazarded by forming a connection unworthy in any way so jealously does he deprecate the interference of his own family on this subject that i have long determined never more to let him see how near it is to my heart and i will not even mention the subject to your brother lest par impossible he might ever discover that i had done so but i wish you love would say a word to him before we leave clifton tell him that frederick has still a great propensity to fall in love at first sight and that we shall all bless him everlastingly if he will prescribe change of air whenever he may happen to see the fit seize him the fair emma promised and kept her word and such was the theme on which their discourse turned the night before the wedding when sir edward being engaged with the lawyer who had just arrived from london with the settlements the brother and sister took that stroll upon the pavement of sion row which had first exhibited the stately figure of colonel hubert to mrs barnaby's admiration little did agnes think when her head was made to obtrude itself through the window upon that occasion that her ears caught some words of a conversation destined to prove so important to her future happiness that the falling in love at first sight had already taken place colonel hubert could not doubt as he watched his enthusiastic friend's look and manner while conversing with agnes and gravely and sorrowfully did he ponder on the words of his sister in their last tete-a-tete save him dearest montague if you can said she from any folly of this sort for i really think sir edward would never be happy again if frederick formed any disgraceful marriage and a disgraceful marriage it would and must be thought he neither her surpassing beauty nor her modest elegance either can make it otherwise as if sent by fate to confirm him in this conviction the widow at this moment approached the party leaning on the arm of the major having finished her fifth rubber and pocketed her sixteen half-crowns major allen's two friends pleaded an engagement elsewhere and mrs barnaby accepted his offered escort to the tea-table a look of happiness is very becoming to many faces 
it will often indeed lend a charm to features that in sorrow can boast of none but there are others on which this genial and expansive emotion produces a different effect and mrs barnaby was one of them her eyes did not only sparkle they perfectly glared with triumph and delight she shook her curls and her feathers with the vivacity of a bacchante when tossing her cymbals in the air in her joyous laugh and her conscious whisper as each in turn attracted attention from all around were exactly calculated to produce just such an effect as the luckless agnes would have lived in silence and solitude for ever to avoid witnessing the habile major described the party the instant he entered the room and led the lady directly to it but the table was fully occupied and for a moment no one stirred but agnes who pale and positively trembling with distress stood up though without saying a word mrs peters coloured and for a second looked doubtful what to do but when she saw major allen address himself with the manner of an old acquaintance to elizabeth she rose and slightly saying i am so sorry you are too late for tea mrs barnaby moved off followed of course by her daughters and the gentlemen attending on them i dare say we shall find a cup that will do never mind us agnes don't you go but try that pot will you at the bottom of the table this is as dry as hay the major was immediately on the alert and seizing on the teapot seized the hand of agnes with it neck cheeks and brow were crimson in an instant and as she withdrew her hand from his audacious touch her eye caught that of colonel hubert fixed upon her shame vexation and something almost approaching to terror brought tears into that beautiful eye and for a moment the gallant soldier forgot everything in an ardent longing to seize by the collar and fling from the chamber the man who had thus dared to offend her but frederick stephenson who also saw the action quitted the side of his partner contrary to all the laws of etiquette and quickly placing himself beside agnes bestowed such a glance on the major as immediately turned the attention of that judicious personage to the teapot and mrs barnaby you dance with me now miss willoughby said young stephenson which as he had enjoyed that honour twice before he had been too discreet to hint at it till the arrival of the widow and the major had rendered her being immediately occupied so particularly desirable agnes perfectly understood his motive and though her cheeks again tingled as she remembered how impossible it was for her to run effectually from the annoyance that so cruelly beset her she felt touched and grateful for his kindness and the smile with which she accepted it would have sufficed to subdue the heart of frederick had an atom of it been unsubdued before End of chapter two volume two chapter three of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three melancholy meditations an eventful walk a pleasant breakfast a comfortable conversation in a closet the slumbers of agnes that night were not heavy for she waked while the birds were still singing their morning hymn to the sun which poured its beams full upon her face through her uncurtained window she turned restlessly upon her little bed and tried to sleep again but it would not do and as she listened to the twittering without so strong a desire seized her to leave the narrow boundary of her little closet and breathe the air of heaven that after the hesitation and struggle of a few moments she yielded and noiselessly creeping out of bed and performing the business of her toilette with the greatest caution ventured to open the door communicating with her aunt's chamber when she had the great satisfaction of hearing her snore loud enough to mask any sound she might herself make in passing through the room in like manner she successfully made her way downstairs and out of the house and her heart beat with something like pleasure as she felt the sweet morning breeze blow from the downs upon her cheek she walked towards the beautiful point on which the windmill stands but alas she was no longer happy enough to feel that the landscape it commanded could confer that sort of perfect felicity which she had before thought belonged to it she sat down again on the same spot where mary lucy james and herself had sat before but with how different a feeling and yet it wanted one whole day of a week since that time what new sorrow was it that weighed thus upon her spirits the good-humoured liking that her new acquaintance then testified towards her had since ripened into friendship at the ball of the preceding evening she had in fashionable phrase met with the most brilliant success she had danced every dance and three of them with the partner that every lady in the room would best have liked to dance with and yet there was a feeling of depression at her heart greater than she had ever been conscious of before how was this could agnes herself tell the cause of it 
yes if she had asked herself she could have answered and have answered truly that it was because she now knew that the better the more estimable the more amiable the society around her might be the more earnestly she ought to endeavour to withdraw from it this conviction was enough to make her feel sad and there was no need to seek farther in order to discover other sources of sadness if any such there were within her bosom and thus she sat again pulling time from the hillside but it was no longer so sweet as before and she threw it from her like a child who has broken its toy and just reached the sage conviction that its gaudy colouring was good for nothing while indulging in this most unsatisfactory fit of musing the sound of a horse's feet almost close behind startled her but instead of turning her head to see whom it might be she started up and walked onward the horseman however was perhaps more curious than herself for he immediately rode past her nor scrupled to turn his head as he did so to ascertain who the early wanderer might be and even before he had done so agnes knew by a moment's glance at his figure as he passed her that it was colonel hubert he checked his horse and touched his hat and for half an instant agnes thought he was going to speak to her perhaps he thought so too but if he did he changed his mind for looking about in the distance as if reconnoitring his position he pressed the sides of his horse and galloped on a groom presently following agnes breathed more freely thank god he did not speak to me she exclaimed if he had i should have wanted power to answer him never no never can i forget were i to see him every day to the end of my life i should never forget the expression of his face as my aunt barnaby and that dreadful man walked up the room towards the tea-table no nor the glance he gave so full of vexation and regret when his kind-hearted sweet-tempered friend asked me again to dance with him proud disdainful man i hope and trust that i may never behold him more it is he who first taught me to know and feel how miserable is the future that awaits me this soliloquy partly muttered and partly thought was here interrupted by her once more hearing the sound of a horse's feet on the turf close behind her he has turned back thought she though i did not see him pass me oh if he speaks to me how shall i answer him but again the horseman rode past and another rapid glance showed her that this time it was not colonel hubert nor did she trouble herself to think whom else it might be and if she had the labour would have been thrown away for in this case as before the rider looked back and displayed to her view the features of major allen he instantly stopped his horse and jumped to the ground then skilfully wheeling the animal around placed himself between it and the terrified agnes and began walking beside her her first impulse was to stand still and ask him wherefore he thus approached her but when she turned towards him to speak the expression of his broad audacious countenance struck her with dismay and she suddenly turned round and walked rapidly and in silence back towards the windmill and the buildings beyond it are you afraid of me my charming young lady said the major with a chuckle again wheeling his charger so as to place himself beside agnes no reason upon my soul how is your adorable aunt tell her i inquired for her and tell her too upon the honour of an officer and a gentleman that i consider her as by far the finest woman i ever saw but why do you run on so swiftly my pretty little fawn your charming aunt will thank me i am sure for not letting you put yourself in a fever and so saying his huge hand grasped the elbow of agnes and he held her forcibly back a feeling of terror greater than the occasion called for perhaps induced agnes to utter a cry at again feeling this hateful gripe which seemed as if by magic to bring her relief for at the same moment colonel hubert was on the other side of her agnes looked up in his face with an undisguised expression of delight and on his offering his arm she took it instantly but without either of them having uttered a word there was something in the arrangement of the trio that major allen did not appear to approve for having taken about three steps in advance he suddenly stopped and saying in a sort of blustering mutter you will be pleased to give my best compliments to your aunt he sprang upon his horse so heedlessly as to render it probable both lady and gentleman might get a kick from the animal and making it bound forward darted off across the down agnes gently withdrew her arm and said but in a voice not over steady indeed sir i am very much obliged to you i am glad to have been near you miss willoughby when that very insolent person addressed you said colonel hubert but without making any second offer of his arm and a moment after he added excuse me for telling you that you are imprudent in walking thus early and alone 
though clifton on this side appears a rural sort of residence it is not without some of the disagreeable features of a watering-place i have lived always in the country i had no idea there was any danger said agnes shocked to think how much her own childish imprudence must have strengthened colonel hubert's worst opinion of her and her connections nor is there perhaps any actual danger replied the colonel but there are many things that may not exactly warrant that name which nevertheless would be very improper for me oh it was great ignorance great folly interrupted agnes eagerly and never never again will i put myself in need of such kindness has your aunt always lived with you in the country was a question which colonel hubert felt greatly disposed to ask but instead of it he said turning down the windmill hill you reside at rodney place i believe and if i mistake not this is the way no sir we lodge in sion row it is here close by do not let me delay your ride any more i am very much obliged to you and without waiting for an answer agnes stepped rapidly down the steep side of the hill and was half-way towards sion row before the colonel felt quite sure of what he had intended to say in return but it is no matter she is gone thought he and taking his reins from the hand of his groom he remounted and resumed his morning ride mrs barnaby had not quitted her bed when agnes returned but she was awake and hearing some one enter the drawing-room called out who's there it is i aunt said agnes opening the door with flushed cheeks and out of breath partly perhaps from the agitation occasioned by her adventure and partly from the speed with which she had walked from the windmill home and where on earth have you been already child mercy on me what a colour you have got the ball has done you good as well as me i think there get in and take your things off and then come back and talk to me while i dress myself agnes went into her little room and shut the door she really was very much afraid of her aunt and in general obeyed her commands with the prompt obedience of a child who fears to be scolded if he make a moment's delay but at this moment a feeling stronger than fear kept her within the blessed sanctuary of her solitary closet she seemed gasping for want of air her aunt's room felt close after coming from the fresh breeze of the hill and it was therefore as agnes thought that the sitting down alone beside her own open window seemed a luxury for which it was worth while to risk the sharpest reprimand that ever aunt gave but why while she enjoyed it did big tears chase each other down her cheeks whatever the cause the effect was salutary she became composed she recovered her breath and her complexion faded to its usual delicate tint or perhaps to a shade paler and then she began to think that it was not wise to do anything for which she knew she should be reproached if she could help it and now she could help it so she smoothed her chestnut tresses bathed her eyes in water and giving one deep sigh at leaving her own side of the door for that which belonged to her aunt she came forth determined to bear very patiently whatever might be said to her fortunately for agnes mrs barnaby had just approached that critical moment of her toilette business when it was her especial will and pleasure to be alone so merely saying in a snappish accent what in the world have you been about so long she added now get along into the drawing-room and take care that the toast and my muffin are ready for me and kept hot before the fire it's almost too hot for fire but i must have my breakfast warm and comfortable and we can let it out afterwards agnes most joyfully obeyed it was a great relief and she was meekly thankful for it but she very nearly forgot the muffins and the toast for the windows of the room were open and looked out upon the windmill and the down a view so pleasant that it was several minutes before she recollected the duties she had to perform at last however she did recollect them and made such good use of the time that remained that when her aunt entered bright in carmine and lilac ribbons everything was as it should be and she had only to sit and listen to her ecstatic encomiums on the ball warm each successive piece of muffin at the end of a fork and answer properly to the ten times repeated question haven't you got a good aunt agnes to take you to such a ball as that at length however the tedious meal was ended and mrs barnaby busied herself considerably more than usual in setting the little apartment in order she made jerningham carefully brush away the crumbs a ceremony sometimes neglected set out her own best pink-lined work-box in state placed the table agreeably at one of the windows with two or three chairs round it and then told agnes that if she had any of her lesson book-work to do she might sit in her own room for she did not want her 
gladly was the mandate obeyed and willingly did she aid betty jacks in putting her tiny premises in order for she was not without hope that her friend mary would pay her a visit there to talk over the events of the evening an occupation for which to say the truth she felt considerably more inclined than for any lesson-book work whatever nor was she disappointed hardly did she feel ready to receive her before her friend arrived and well carina how fares it with you to-day do you not feel almost too big for your little room after all the triumphs of last night was the gay address of miss peters as she seated herself upon one of agnes's boxes but it was not answered in the same tone nay there was much of reproof as well as sadness in the accent with which agnes uttered triumphs oh mary what a word you are the only one i believe who would quarrel with it did ever a little country girl under seventeen make a more successful debut did ever country girl of any age have more reason to feel that she never ought to make any debut at all my poor agnes said miss peters more gravely it will not do for you to feel so deeply the follies that may and i fear ever will be committed by your aunt and my aunt barnaby it is a sad vexing business beyond all doubt that you should have to go into company with a woman determined to make herself so outrageously absurd but it is not fair to remember that and nothing else you should at least recollect also that the most distinguished man in the room paid you the compliment of joining your party at tea paid me the compliment oh mary and oh agnes can you pretend to doubt that it was in compliment to you and in compliment to whom was it that he danced with you he never danced with me mary said agnes colouring my dear child what are you talking about why he danced with you three times oh yes mr stephenson he is indeed the kindest most obliging and the handsomest partner that you ever danced with is it not so that may easily be mary if by partner you mean a gentleman partner for i never danced with any till last night and it is only saying that he is handsomer than your brother and mr osborne and i think he is and i think so too therefore on that point we shall not quarrel but tell me how did you like the ball altogether did it please you were you amused shall you be longing to go to another let me answer your last question first i hope never 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 again to go to the ball with my aunt barnaby but had it not been for the pain the shame the agony she caused me i should have liked it very much indeed particularly the tea-time mary how pleasant it was before she came with that horrid horrid man shall you ever forget the sight as they came up the room towards us oh how he looked at her agnes shuddered and pressed her hands to her eyes as if to shut out an object that she still saw it was tremendous replied her friend but don't worry yourself by thinking mr stephenson looked at her just then for he really did not you know he was sitting at the corner of the table by me and his back was turned to her thank heaven but i will tell you who did look at her if stephenson did not that magnificent-looking colonel stared as if he had seen an apparition but i did not mind that half so much nor you either i suppose an old soldier like him must be used to such a variety of quizzes that nobody i imagine can appear so preposterous to him as they might do to his young friend by the by i think he is a very fine-looking man for his age don't you who said agnes innocently why colonel hubert his sister who is just married to sir edward stephenson is nearly twenty years younger than he is they say twenty years said agnes yes must it not be strange to see them together as brother and sister he must seem so much more like her father her father said agnes yes i should think so but you do not talk half as much about the ball as i expected agnes i think you were disappointed and yet i do not know how that could be you dance beautifully and seem very fond of it you had the best partners in the room danced every dance and were declared on all sides to be the belle par excellence and yet you do not seem to have enjoyed it oh i did enjoy it all the time that she was out of the room playing cards i enjoyed it very very much indeed so much that i am surprised at myself to feel how soon all my painful shyness was forgotten but after all mary though you call your aunt barnaby as if to comfort me by sharing my sufferings she is not really your aunt and still less is she your sole protector still less is she the being on whom you depend for your daily bread alas my dear mary 
is there not more cause for surprise in my having enjoyed the ball so much than in my not having enjoyed it more my poor agnes this is sad indeed said mary all her gaiety vanishing at once for it is true do not think me indifferent to your most just sorrow would to heaven i could do anything effectually to alleviate it but while you are here at least endeavour to think more of us and less of her wherever you are known you will be respected for your own sake and that is worth all other respect depend upon it when you leave us indeed i shall be very anxious for you tell me dear agnes something more about your aunt compton is it quite possible that you should be placed under her protection oh yes she would not hear of it she paid for my education and all my other expenses during five years and my aunt barnaby says that when she undertook to do this she expressly said that it was all she could ever do for me they say that she has ruined her little fortune by lavish and indiscriminate charity to the poor and aunt barnaby says that she believes that she has hardly enough left to keep herself alive but i sometimes think mary that i could be very happy if she would let me work for her and help her and perhaps give lessons in silverton i know some things already well enough perhaps to teach in such a remote place as that when better masters cannot be procured and i should be so happy in doing this if aunt compton would but let me live with her then why do you not tell her so agnes because the last the only time i have seen her for years though she kissed and embraced me for a moment she pushed me from her afterwards and said i was only more artful than aunt barnaby and that i should never be either graced or disgraced by her those were her words i shall never forget them and she has the reputation of being immovably obstinate in her resolves that does not look very promising i must confess but wisdom tells us that the possibility of future sorrow should never present our enjoying present happiness now i do think dear agnes that just now you may enjoy yourself if you like us as well as we like you for we are all determined to endure aunt barnaby for your sake and in return you must resolve to be happy in spite of her for ours and now adieu i want to have some talk with mamma this morning but i dare say you will hear from me or see me again before the end of the day farewell and miss peters made a quiet exit from the closet and from the house for she had heard voices in the drawing-room as she came up the stairs and now heard voices in the drawing-room as she went down and having business in her head upon which she was exceedingly intent she was anxious to avoid being seen or heard by mrs barnaby lest she should be detained End of chapter three volume two chapter four of the widow barnaby by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four a tete a tete in a drawing-room autobiography a remarkable discovery concerning the duke of wellington the voices which alarmed miss peters were those of mrs barnaby and major allen the acquaintance between them had gone quite far enough on the preceding evening to justify the gentleman's aimable empressement to inquire for the lady's health besides he was somewhat curious to know if the pretty skittish young creature he had encountered in his morning's ride had recounted the adventure to her aunt it was his private opinion that she had not and if so he should know what to think of the sudden appearance and protecting demeanour of her tall friend it was thus he reasoned as he walked towards sion row as soon as he had finished his breakfast and yet though he had lost so little time he did not arrive till at least three minutes after the widow had begun to expect him i need not ask my charming mrs barnaby how she rested after her ball eyes do not sparkle thus unless they have been blessed with sleep and the lady's hand was taken bowed upon and the tips of her fingers kissed before she had quite recovered the soft embarrassment his entrance had occasioned you are very kind to call upon me major allen do sit down i live as yet comparatively in great retirement for during mr barnaby's lifetime we saw an immense deal of company that old-fashioned sort of country visiting you know that never leaves one's house empty i could not stand it when i was left alone and that was the reason i left my beautiful place silverton or silverton park was it not i think i have heard of it yes silverton and do you know major that the remembrance of all that racket and gaiety was so oppressive to my nerves during the first months of my widowhood that i threw off everything that reminded me of it sold my carriages and horses left my place turned off all my servants 
and positively when i set off for this place in order to see my sister peters and her family i knew not if i should ever have strength or spirits to enter into general society again thank god dearest madam that you have made the effort though the hardened and more worn nature of man cannot melt with all the softness of yours there is yet within us a chord that may be made to vibrate in sympathy when words of true feeling reach it how well i understood your feelings and how difficult it is not to envy even in death the being who has left such a remembrance behind but we must not dwell on this tell me dear mrs barnaby tell as to a friend who understands and appreciates you do you regret the having left your elegant retirement or do you feel as i trust you do that providence has not gifted you so singularly for nothing do you feel that your fellow-creatures have a claim upon you and that it ought not to be in secret and in solitude that the hours of such a being should be spent tell me do you feel this alas major allen there is so much weakness in the heart of a woman that she is hardly sure for many days together how she ought to feel we are all impulse all soul all sentiment and our destiny must ever depend upon the friends we meet in our passage through this thorny world beautiful idea where is the poet that has more sweetly painted the female heart and what a study it offers when such a heart is thrown open to one good god to see a creature so formed for enjoyment so beaming with innocent cheerfulness so rich in the power of conferring happiness wherever she deigns to smile to see such a being turn weeping and alone from her hospitable halls and from all the pomp and splendour that others cling to what a spectacle have you no lingering regret dearest lady for having left your charming mansion perhaps there are moments or rather i should say perhaps there have been moments when something of the kind has crossed me but if i had not disposed of my place i should never have seen clifton my spirits wanted the change and i feel already better in this delightful air but i confess i do regret having sold my beautiful greys i shall never meet any i like so well again a set were they oh yes four greys and all well matched perfectly poor mr barnaby took so much pains about it it was his delight to please me i ought not to have sold them it was a pity said the kind major with a sigh don't talk about it major allen and here one of the widow's most curiously embroidered pocket handkerchiefs delightfully scented with musk was lightly and carefully applied to her eyes nay said the major venturing gently to withdraw it you must not yield to this dangerous softness i cannot bear to have those eyes concealed it produces the chilling sensation of an eclipse at noonday i shall run away from you if you will not look at me no do not said the widow making an effort to smile which was rewarded by a look of gratitude and a seemingly involuntary kiss bestowed upon the hand that had withdrawn the envious handkerchief and that pretty little girl your niece mrs barnaby said the major as if considerately changing the conversation how is she this morning oh quite well poor child and in my dressing-room going over her italian and french lessons before she does them with me good heaven is it possible that you devote yourself thus take care charming mrs barnaby take care that you do not permit your affectionate nature to form an attachment to that young person which may destroy all your future prospects in life at your age and with your exquisite beauty you ought to be looking forward to the renewal of the tender tie that has already made your happiness and who is there pardon me if i speak boldly who is there who would venture to give his whole heart his soul his entire existence to one who has no heart to give in return thank you mrs barnaby that it can be in the power of any niece in the world to atone to a woman of your exquisite sensibility for the loss of that ardent affection which can only exist between a husband and wife tell me do you believe this it is a question replied the widow casting her eyes upon the ground that i have never asked myself then neglect it no longer for god's sake for the sake of your future happiness which must be so inexpressibly dear to all who know you all who appreciate you justly for the sake of the young girl herself do not involve yourself by undertaking the duties of a mother towards one who from her age could never have stood you in the relation of a child alas no 
said mrs barnaby i lost my only babe a few weeks before its father had it lived it would this spring have been three years old you say true the age of agnes must ever prevent my feeling for her as a child of my own my poor sister was indeed so much older than myself that i always rather looked upon her as an aunt or as a mother than as my sister of course you must have done so and interesting and inexpressibly touching as it is to witness your beautiful tenderness towards her child it is impossible not to feel that this tenderness carried too far will inevitably destroy the future happiness of your life forgive i implore you a frankness that can only proceed from my deep interest in your welfare is this young person entirely dependent upon you at this moment she is but she will be provided for at the death of her great-aunt miss elizabeth compton of compton bassett and to say the truth major allen as you so kindly interest yourself in what concerns me i neither do nor ever shall consider myself bound to retain agnes willoughby in my family under any circumstances that should render her being so inconvenient i delight in receiving such an assurance dear excellent mrs barnaby what a heart what an understanding what beauty what unequalled sweetness no wonder the late mr barnaby delighted as you say to please you lives there the man as the immortal byron says lives there the man with soul so dead as to be capable of doing otherwise but to return to the subject of this poor little girl she might be termed pretty perhaps in any society but yours tell me is this mrs compton of compton bassett wealthy is she also a relation of yours yes she is immensely wealthy it is a magnificent estate she is a maiden sister of my father's then miss willoughby will eventually be a great fortune how old is your aunt my aunt is near sixty i believe but the provision intended for agnes is only sufficient to maintain her like a gentlewoman the bulk of the property is settled on me and my heirs i fear you will think me an unseasonable visitor said the fully satisfied major rising and i will go now lest you should refuse to admit me again do not go yet said the gentle widow playfully refusing the hand extended to take leave what in the world now have you got to do that should prevent your bestowing a little more time on me it would be difficult mrs barnaby said the major with an eloquent look to find any occupation sufficiently attractive to take me from you so long as i dared flatter myself that it was your wish i should remain well then sit down again major allen for do you know i want you to tell me all about yourself where have you served what dangers have you passed through you have no idea how much interest i should take in listening to the history of your past life my sweet friend never should i have entered upon such a subject unbidden yet with such an auditor how dear will the privilege become of talking of myself but you must check me if i push your gentle patience too far tell me when you are weary of me or of my little narrative i will i will depend upon it only do not stop till i do major adorable sweetness thus then i am to be my own biographer and to a listener whose opinion would in my estimation outweigh that of all the congregated world if placed in judgment on my actions it is probable my charming friend that my name as ensign allen may not be totally unknown to you it was while i still held that humble rank that i was first fortunate enough to distinguish myself in an affair of some importance in the peninsula i turned what might have been a very disastrous defeat into a most complete victory and was immediately promoted to a company shortly after this i chanced to show the same sort of spirit which was i believe born with me in a transaction no wise professional but which nevertheless made me favourably mentioned and certainly contributed to bring me into the rather general notice with which europe at present honours me yet it was merely an affair with a party of brigands in which i put seven fellows hors de combat and thereby enabled that celebrated grandee the duke d'almafonte d'aragona d'estrada to escape together with his beautiful daughter and all their jewels the service might have been i own of considerable importance to them but the gratitude it produced in the minds of both father and daughter greatly exceeded what was called for he offered me so widely separate as we now are there can be no indelicacy in my confiding the circumstance to you my dear mrs barnaby but 
the fact is he offered me his only daughter in marriage with an immense fortune but alas how capricious is the human will my hour my dear friend was not yet come i felt beautiful as isabella d'almafonte was accounted by all the world that i could not give her my heart and i performed the painful duty of refusing her hand nothing however could be more noble than the subsequent conduct of the duke at the first painful moment he only said captain allen we must submit of course he said it in spanish but it would look like affectation in such a narrative as this were i not to translate it capitano aleno bisogno sumitaio nos were his words i am sure i shall never forget them for they touched me to the very heart i could not speak my feelings choked me and i left his palace in silence five years had elapsed and i had perhaps too nearly forgotten the lovely but unfortunate isabella d'almafonte when i received a packet from a notary of madrid informing me that her illustrious father was dead and had gratefully bequeathed me a legacy amounting in english money to thirty thousand pounds sterling i was by that time already in possession of the estates of my ancestors and such a sum might have appeared a very useless bagatelle had not an accident rendered it at the time of really important convenience good heaven how interesting exclaimed mrs barnaby and what dear major became of the unfortunate isabella she took the veil mrs barnaby in the convent de los sorores dolentes within a few months of her noble father's death before this event she had not the power of disposing of herself as she wished but her excellent father never tortured her by the proposal of any other marriage admirable man cried mrs barnaby greatly touched dear major allen she added in a voice that seemed to deprecate opposition you must indeed you must do me an immense favour when mrs peters took me to bristol in her coach the other day i bought myself this album it has got nothing in it as yet but my own name now if you do not wish to break my heart you must write the name of isabella d'almafonte in this first page it will be an autograph inexpressibly interesting the major took the book and the pen that were offered by the two hands of mrs barnaby and said with a profound sigh break your heart i should never have broken the heart of any woman if what she asked had been seconded by such eyes as those a silence of some moments followed a part of which was employed by the major in writing the name of isabella d'almafonte and a part in gazing on the downcast lids of the admired eyes opposite to him but this too trying interval ended at length by the lady's recovering herself enough to say and that accident major allen that made the duke's little legacy convenient to you what was it do not have any reserve with one whom you have honoured by the name of a friend reserve to you never while you continue to admit me to your presence all reserve on my part must be impossible the accident was this my friend and i am not sorry to name it as it gives me an opportunity of alluding to a subject that i would rather you heard mentioned by me than by any other after the battle of waterloo concerning which by the by i should like to tell you an anecdote after the battle of waterloo i became in common with nearly all the officers of the army an idle man and like too many others i was tempted to seek a substitute for the excitement produced by the military ardour in which i had lived by indulging the pernicious agitations of the gaming-table it is very likely that if you speak of me in general society you will be told that i have played high my dear mrs barnaby this is true my large fortune gave me as i foolishly imagined a sort of right to play high if it amused me and for a little while i confess it did amuse me but i soon found that a gentleman was no match for those who made gambling a profession and i lost largely so largely indeed that i must have saddled my acres with a mortgage had not the legacy of the duke d'almafonte d'aragona d'estrada reached me just in time to prevent the necessity i rejoice to hear it replied the widow kindly and you have never hazarded so largely since dear major have you oh never in fact i never enter a room now where anything like high play is going on i cannot bear even to see it and i believe i have in this way offended many who still permit themselves this hateful indulgence offended them indeed to such a degree that they perfectly hate me and utter the most virulent abuse every time they hear my name mentioned 
but for this i care little i know i am right mrs barnaby and that what loses their friendship and esteem may be the means of gaining for me the regard of those perhaps on whom my happiness may depend during my future life the same dangerous sort of silence as before seemed creeping on them but again the widow had the courage to break it by recalling to the memory of her musing and greatly preoccupied companion the anecdote respecting waterloo which he had promised her waterloo said he rousing himself ay dearest mrs barnaby i will tell you that though there are many reasons which render me very averse to speak of it lightly in the first place by those who know me not it might be thought to look like boasting and moreover if i alluded to it in any society capable of the baseness of repeating what i said it might bring upon me very active and indeed fatal proofs of the dislike i may say hatred already felt against me in a certain quarter gracious heaven major be careful then i implore you before whom you speak there appear to be many strangers here of whose characters it is impossible to know anything if you have enemies they may be spies expressly sent to watch you i sometimes think so i assure you i catch such singular looks occasionally as nothing else can account for and the enemy i allude to is one who has the power as well as will to punish by evil reports if he cannot positively crush and ruin those who interfere with his ambition is it possible thank heaven at least you can have no doubt of me so tell me i beseech you to tell me to whom it is that your alarming words refer the major drew his chair close to mrs barnaby took one of her hands between both of his and having gazed for a moment very earnestly in her face whispered the duke of wellington good god exclaimed the widow quite in an agony the duke of wellington is the duke of wellington your enemy major allen to the teeth my fairest to the teeth replied the major firmly setting the instruments he mentioned and muttering through them with an appearance of concentrated rage the outward demonstration of which was increased by the firmness of the grasp in which he continued to hold her hand but how can this be so faltered mrs barnaby so brave a man as you one too who had distinguished himself so early how can he be so base how can he be otherwise my friend replied the major with increasing agitation when and here he lowered his voice still more whispering almost in her very ear it is i i ferdinand alexander allen who ought by right to be the duke of wellington instead of him who now wears the title you astonish me more than i am able to express of course i do such however is the fact the battle of waterloo would have been lost was lost positively lost till i disdaining in such a moment to receive orders from one whom i perceived to be incompetent rushed forward almost knocking the duke off his horse as i did so sent back the french army like a flock of sheep before an advancing lion seized with my own hand on the cocked hat of napoleon drew it from his head and actually flogged his horse with it till horse and rider seemed well enough inclined to make the best of their way out of my reach god bless you my dearest lady the duke of wellington had no more to do in gaining the battle of waterloo than you had i now leave you to judge what his feelings towards me are likely to be full of envy and hatred beyond all doubt solemnly replied mrs barnaby and i will not deny major allen that i think there is great danger in your situation a person of such influence may do great injury even to a man of your well-known noble character but how extraordinary it is that no hint of this has ever transpired i beg your pardon my dear madam this is very far from being the case at your peaceful residence beneath the shades of silverton park it is highly probable that you may have remained ignorant of the fact but in truth the duke's reputation among the people of england has suffered greatly though no one indeed has yet proposed that his sword should be taken from him the well-known circumstance of stones having been thrown at his windows a fact which probably has never reached you is quite sufficient to prove that the people must be aware that what the english army did at waterloo was not done under his generalship no no england knows too well what she owed to that victory so to treat the general who achieved it 
and had they not felt doubts as to who that general was no stones would have been levelled at aspley house many of the common soldiers fine fellows have been bold enough to name me and it is this that has so enraged the duke that there is nothing which he has not taught his emissaries to say against me i have been called swindler blackleg radical horse-jockey and i know not what beside and i should not wonder my charming friend if sooner or later your friendship were put to the proof by having to listen to similar calumnies against me but now you will be able to understand them aright and know the source from whence they come well i never did hear anything so abominable in my life said mrs barnaby warmly not content with taking credit to himself for all that was gained by your extraordinary bravery he has the baseness to attack your character it is too detestable and i only hope that when i get among my own connections in town i shall not have the misfortune of meeting him often i am certain i should not be able to resist saying something to show what i thought oh if he were really the brave man that he has been fancied to be how he must have adored you for your undaunted courage and you really took napoleon's hat off his head how excessively brave i wish i could have seen it major i am sure i should have worshipped you i do so dote upon bravery sweet creature that devoted love of courage is one of the loveliest propensities of the female mind yes i am brave i do not scruple to say so and the idea that this quality is dear to you will strengthen it in me fourfold but my dear my lovely friend i must bid you adieu i expect the steward of my property in yorkshire to-day and i rather think he must be waiting for me now soften then the pain of this parting by telling me that i may come again i should be sorry indeed to think this was our last meeting major allen said the widow gently i am seldom out in the morning before the hour at which you call to-day farewell then said he kissing her hand with an air of mixed tenderness and respect farewell and remember that all i have breathed into your friendly ear must be sacred but i know it would be so without this injunction mrs barnaby's majestic beauty conceals not the paltry spirit of a gossip indeed you are right indeed you are right to my feelings the communications of a friend are sweet solemn pledges of regard that it would be a sacrilege to violate farewell major farewell End of chapter 4